this morning, we took on the entire book of Habakkuk. Now, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, they're two books that probably your average churchgoer is not extremely familiar with. And they both actually do have a lot of end times prophecy in them. They're no Daniel. It's no revelation. But they both do look to the coming of the Lord. Habakkuk with his vision in chapter 3 of the day of the Lord. And Zephaniah, whom makes more direct references to the day of the Lord than any other prophet of the Old Testament. You got 16 Old Testament prophets, and he makes more references to the day of the Lord than any of them. Uh, he uses, you know, different phrasing for the same thing, but that's kind of the emphasis of the whole book of Zephaniah is the day of the Lord. So, timeline-wise, uh, Zephaniah, we can pin down a little bit better than Habakkuk, but they're both about the same time. And Zephaniah is a little bit disputed, the same with Habakkuk, for that matter, when you talk about when is the exact timing of this book. But Zephaniah makes it a little easier. In verse 1 of Zephaniah, it, it says, The word of the Lord which came to Zephaniah, the son of Cushi, the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hezekiah. In the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. So at least we have Zephaniah narrowed down to one king. And often the big question is, is this before or after the great reforms of Josiah? Josiah's reforms took place in 622 B.C. I believe it takes place after I think it is a few years after those reforms, and there's little hints throughout here. It seems like people who were drawing to the Lord are now drawing back. In fact, chapter 1, verse 6, those who've turned back. Now, prior to his reforms, really no one was following the Lord at all, it seemed like. So it wasn't like there was a group turning back. They were all fully turned and had been turned for a generation. And so it seems like after he does his major reforms, has the greatest Passover celebration but then many of the people turned right back, which is what Huldah the prophetess told Josiah was going to happen. So Zephaniah, I believe, is in the latter portion, though it takes place before 612 B.C., which is the destruction of Nineveh, because Nineveh was not yet destroyed, according to Zephaniah 2.13. So it puts us in a window, 622 to 612 B.C. I'm sure you're all going to sleep better at night that you know the year that the book of Zephaniah was written. That was probably the number one thing you want to walk away with today. But for me, it does help, because I'm trying to interpret what the author was trying to get across to his audience. And so when you know who he's talking to, that really helps me understand, okay, what is he trying to get across? When I know that Chronicles was written likely by Ezra to Jews in Babylon, and he was trying to encourage them to come home, I can interpret the book knowing that, okay, this is the, the feel and the vibe of what's going on. Habakkuk probably could have been, he could have been a contemporary of Zephaniah, and Habakkuk could have been a little bit later going into the next few kings that none of us know by name because they all are so mixed match and have eight names apiece. We covered that last week. Some people think Habakkuk could have been earlier, but regardless, we're getting those two guys done today before we start Isaiah next week. Moving again chronologically, we're backing up to Isaiah and then we'll be moving forward through the major prophets. And so something that again is it's just a little introductory note it may be of interest to some of you but there is this chiastic structure to the book and this is something that i've only talked a few times about but you see this in the psalms you see this a lot in the book of daniel and what it is it's a pattern where the writer does like a a b a sometimes it's a b b a sometimes it's a b c b a but it's like a pyramid is the idea. It goes one way, then swings back. And so what we find is Zephaniah, in all of his parts on judgment, the end of the book is Millennial Kingdom. It's a great ending to the book. But it starts with a couple verses, worldwide judgment, speaking of the ultimate day of the Lord. But then he backs up to judgment of Judah, verses 
chapter 1, verse 4, to chapter 2, verse 3. Then it goes to the judgment of the surrounding nations, chapter 2, verse 4 to 15. Then it backs up again to the judgment of Jerusalem and Judah in chapter 3, 1 to 7. And then verse 8, again, worldwide judgment. And so there's just kind of like it goes from worldwide to God's people, surrounding nation, God's people, worldwide. Follows this little pattern. So all that said, I guess before we move on quickly, Verse 1, again, you'll note that it does say he, he's four generations from King Hezekiah. And almost all scholars agree this is King Hezekiah. There's no other reason to give a genealogy. No other prophet gives a far back genealogy as this one. So it's obvious he was going back for a reason. And the reason is Hezekiah. And timeline-wise, uh, Josiah was a third from Hezekiah. And so these guys, he would have been young, and he probably would have been close to Josiah's age. And so here he is now prophesying actually in the time of a relative. They would have been like cousins, essentially. And so verse 2, I will utterly consume everything. This is part of that worldwide judgment part. From the face of the land, says the Lord, I will consume man and beast. I will consume the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, and the stumbling blocks along with the wicked. I will cut off man from the face of the land, says the Lord. This book is going to talk specifically about the upcoming judgment of the nation of Israel and the surrounding nations, but it's also the ultimate judgment. Again, this day of the Lord theme. He's looking out to that future day of the Lord. And we see again and again in prophecy, something that I think can confuse, can stumble people is quite often God has these prophecies and you watch near fulfillments and then far fulfillments. You watch near lesser and far greater. When you look at these promises in Deuteronomy and the promises like Deuteronomy chapter 30 and you look at Solomon's prayer in 2 Chronicles 6, and it's this whole, if you disobey, I'll carry you away to a faraway land. But when you get your head on straight, I'll bring you back home. Well, he did that with Babylon. And they were gone 70 years, but he did it again with Rome. And they were gone for almost 2,000 years, and God got them back home again. And so we see a lesser fulfillment. You would have thought Babylon was a pretty big fulfillment. But you'll even find that some of the prophecies of the destruction of Israel weren't as fulfilled by Babylon as they were by Rome. They talk about plowing you flat. The Babylonians destroyed a lot, but they didn't plow the city the Romans li literally built a plow, plows, and plowed the temple flat. They literally drug things across to plow the city. And so you'll find that Babylon was a nearer prophecy fulfillment. Rome was a latter. The day of the Lord, he would send Babylon to judge them. But there's going to be an ultimate day of the Lord where it'll be worldwide. Now moving to Judah. He says, I will stretch out my hand against Judah, verse 4, and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. I will cut off every trace of Baal from this place, the names of the idolatrous priests and with the pagan priests and those who worship the hosts of heaven on the housetop, those who worship and swear oaths by the Lord, by Yahweh, but also swear by Milcom, which is the same as Molech. So Isaiah 29, 13 Inasmuch as these people draw near with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but have removed their hearts from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the commandment of men. Jesus quotes this in Matthew 15. And he's just saying, these are people who might have some outward acts that look godly, but at the end of the day, they're two-faced. They're saying one thing and they're doing another. And I will say, as we look at these judgments in chapter 1, they were of Israel, but if you look at the church today, many of these things still apply very much so today. And Israel was awaiting Babylon in judgment. We are awaiting the day of the Lord and the final judgment. So the first thing he's saying is the people who say one thing and do another. I'm going to judge those people. They say one thing, but their hearts aren't really with me, and they are doing another. In verse 6, it says, Those who have turned back and follow, from following the Lord and have not sought the Lord, nor inquired of him. So this is one of the things I think that shows that it's after the reforms of Josiah, because people had started following him, but now they're turning back. 
Hebrews 10.39, it says, But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believing to the saving of the soul. Hebrews talks about being drawn and drawing back. You can't draw back unless you were first drawn. Verse 6 of Zephaniah, right? Those who have turned back. You can't turn back unless you were first turned towards. And this is not describing just you know, people who are just unbelievers, but these are people who had turned to the Lord, who had been drawing to the Lord, but now they're drawing back. To me, this speaks of the soil that is the stony soil Jesus talks about. You see what looks like life. The, the word of God is received with joy, and it seems to spring up for a season, but then the plant dies off because it never really had any roots. Uh, John, in his first epistle, he talks about they went out from us because they were not of us. And if they were of us, they would have continued with us. And so it just talks about those who joined the bandwagon for a while. In honesty, during those reforms of Josiah, I'm sure many people showed up because it was exciting. They showed up because something cool was happening and it was moving, and so let's join in with the fun. But then they turned back. And so he's saying, now these people, I'm coming to judge them as well. Verse 7, it says, Be silent in the presence of the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is at hand. For the Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He has invited his guests. And it shall be in the day of the Lord's sacrifice that I will punish the princes and the king's children and all such are as clothed with foreign apparel. In this, and actually, I'll, I'll even pause there. No, okay, verse 9. And in the same day, I will punish all those who leap over the threshold, who fill their master's house with violence and deceit. And so part of the judgment here, he talks about the king's children. Again, another hint I think that it's later in Josiah's reign because he was 18 when the book of the Lord was found. And so here we have his kids, the king's children. They're dressed in foreign apparel. Now we're going to find that all of Josiah's descendants, all three of his sons, well, three of his four sons will reign as king for a season. And all three are wicked. And they will all not serve the Lord. This wearing foreign apparel might seem like a small thing, but, but the point is, is that we, we're all familiar with Levitical laws and all these laws of the Jewish people. And we know even today, Hasidic Jews and whatnot, we see them with their curly sideburns and they, they've got their prayer shawls on with the tallit tassels hanging out below. The Hasidic Jews are wearing the big black hat and they've got the outfit. God's people were always called to be different. And that's no different in the church. We might not wear different clothes or this or that, but we're called to be different. We're called to be not of this world, not like everyone else. You should stand out like a sore thumb. And it's not my thumb, but I have an infected cut on my index finger and it stands out and it hurts a lot. It's been bugging me all day. But I'm continually noticing it. And you should stand out and be noticed these guys are in foreign apparel, i.e., they're dressing like the foreigners, like the world. They are blending in and being uh, assimilated into the foreign worldly society. We should be different. We don't need to dress weird. We don't need to do anything above and beyond to stand out, you know, and make ourselves known. But we should be abnormally normal. We should just be normal people, live in normal lives, but something stands out about us because of our character, salt and light. And I recently heard it said, I like this. We all know we're supposed to be salt and light. He says, you don't hear salt, you taste it. And you don't hear light, you see it. Your faith cannot just be what you talk about and your words. It's what people need to see and taste in you what they experience in you, not just the word, I am a Christian, I believe in Jesus. That's good. Now let's see it. Let's taste it. Let this be something that we can witness by the way you live. And when it talks about them leaping over the threshold, that's a unique word there in verse 9, threshold, and it it's exclusively means a temple threshold. 
Now, what that means, scholars kind of differ. Some people think it's talking about like the Philistines who had this thing where they wouldn't step on their threshold. They go over the threshold. But this leaping action, it, it seems almost more it's like someone who's kind of like rushing into the church. It's the threshold of a temple or the temple. And so it is the threshold. There's an article, the threshold. So it's like people just kind of rush into church. These people are dressing like everyone else. They're living like everyone else. They, they get into church quick and they get out quick. We don't know anyone who does that. Um, and there, verse 10, shall be on that day, says the Lord, the sound of a mournful cry from the fish gate, a wailing from the second quarter, and a loud crashing from the hills. Wail, you inhabitants of Maktesh, for all the merchant people are cut down and those who handle money are cut off. For what it's worth, this is a actual, very literal and picturesque description of the way that Jerusalem would be uh, taken by Nebuchadnezzar as well as others because no one ever took it from the east, usually from the north. The north was always the side they defended because it had the most flat approach. The fish gate is one of the northern gates. It's where like the modern day Damascus gate is. The ancient gate was the fish gate when you're talking about ancient, ancient first temple. And so from the fish gate to the second quarter, Maktesh is the merchant, the, sorry, the, the market district. So it's where the merchants were. And so how they would sweep down into the city. And it's kind of just from north to south, talking about the areas of the city that were going to be conquered. Verse 12, it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with lamps, which just speaks of a thorough searching. I'm going to have lamps so I can look under and in and behind and punish the men who are settled in complacency, who say in their heart, the Lord will do no good, nor will he do, or the Lord will, nor will he do evil. You see this settled in complacency. I think if you read out of a King James, you'll have on their lees, the, the dregs, wine talk. So it's, the idea is it's, this would have been a colloquial Hebraism, a Hebrew phrase, they get it. You know, you got the wine, you got the dregs. You've got the, the stuff that settles at the bottom of the barrel, right? And the idea is, is that you shake that barrel, move that barrel at all. Well, that stuff floats up and around and in the wine. But when it's settled on the lees, the dregs, it, it hasn't been moved. It's not moving. It's not, it's not being shaken. So that's why they say it's really complacency, apathy. God is searching not just to punish the wicked, not the unjust, the violent, the immoral. He's going to look for the complacent, the ones who just were doing nothing. Romans chapter 1 gives us one of our longest laundry lists of sinful lifestyle behaviors you can find. And when you get to the very bottom, it has everything. I always like reminding like the youth group. It's like, so you see as murderers and the next thing is disobedient to parents. Note that order there, okay? Right next to each other. And then you get down to the bottom and it says, these are deserving of death. Not only those, but also those who, who approve of such things. And it actually shows that God is saying, here's the list of the things people are doing. He goes, but I'm also looking at the people who are approving of that stuff. And that's what he's talking about here, the complacency. When evil is taking place and people don't speak out, they just kind of let it go on. I don't think this means that you need to be out there with a megaphone, but I think it's the idea when it's taking place in front of you, when the Lord's name is blasphemed in your conversation with someone, though it's not you saying it, we can speak up. We can do it kindly. We can do it tactfully, lovingly. Just like, hey, you know, Watch, watch that. Watch that. You know, God says he will not hold him guiltless who takes my name in vain. So I've got your back, bro. You know, and just let people know, not sit back and say nothing. And it, these people say the Lord will not do good, nor will he do evil. Again, in times related, we quoted this morning from 2 Peter 3, and I actually quoted this. But again, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. The Lord will not do good. The Lord will not do evil. 
everything's just going like it's always gone. God's not stepping in. God's not in control. And they just live life complacently as if God does nothing. Therefore, their goods shall become booty, and their house is a desolation. They shall build houses, but not inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards, but not drink their wine. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hastens quickly. The noise of the day of the Lord is bitter. There the mighty men shall cry out. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of devastation and desolation, of darkness and gloominess, clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet and alarm against fortified cities and against the high towers. This description reminded me of Joel as he speaks of the day of the Lord. Joel chapter 2, verses 30 and 31, which Peter quotes on the day of Pentecost. He says, And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and awesome day of the Lord. I forget who the artist was, but the, the picture I use for Zephaniah is a famous painting of the day of the Lord. And so this is the description of this awesome day. If you weren't with us this morning, you might actually go back a page in your Bible and look at Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 3 on down to 15. He's describing the day of the Lord, watching the Lord come and his arrows go out and his spear is glistening. And it describes him in verse 3 of coming out of Taman, out of Mount Paran. And again, that's speaking of coming up out of Eden, out of Basra, as we read in Isaiah 63. And so it's just this picture of, the, of God coming and all of his glory, his terror and fear with him. It says in verse 17, I will bring distress upon men and they shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood shall be poured out like dust and their flesh like refuse. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath, but the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy for he will make speedy riddance of all those who dwell on the land. This is good stuff, honestly. The, where is God? Habakkuk, right? Why, God? Where are you? Why are you letting? And God says, Habakkuk, it's coming. It's coming at a time. I've got an appointed time. It's, it's going to tarry, but it's not going to tarry long, Habakkuk. Don't worry. And when it happens, you'll all see. And so this is, again, the same, sim a similar vision, I should say, that Habakkuk had of God coming. One day I will judge Habakkuk. I know right now there's evil. I know right now there's bad things. But one day I will come and I'll put an end to it all. So what do we have to do in response to this? It says in chapter 2, verse 1, gather yourselves together. Yes, gather together, O undesirable nation. Now, undesirable, it, it's shameless. He, he's calling the, the Israel because they're not doing well. But what they ought to be doing, rather than going off and getting in all this sin, they should be gathering. And this should, at least for most of us, make us think of Hebrews 10, 24, and 5. We as the church, as Christians, are called, right, to consider one another, to be thinking about one another, in order to stir up love and good works. I can't love you guys and do good works for you guys if I'm not considering and thinking of you. And I should not be forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some. I know you don't believe it, but some people skip church. <laughs> but exhorting one another and so much more, guys, as you see the day approaching. So when we read about the day of the Lord, this is what it's talking about in Hebrews 10. If it seems like history is culminating, if it seems like wickedness, because that's how God's hourglass works. God doesn't use months, days, minutes, seconds, years, decades, centuries. God has a timeline that works off of wickedness. And when it got to Josiah, God said, it's full, and I'm going to come in, and the Babylonians are going to clean house. Well, that timeline kind of got reset for the church, and he's waiting and he's watching as the last believers coming to know the Lord are coming into the fold and as wickedness arises greater and greater and worse and worse. And for anyone, 
I'd say over the age of 50 especially, if you guys can look at what has happened exponentially in the last 30 years, imagine what will happen if we're around for another 10. Because it's happening exponentially. I mean, I'm not even 40, and I mean, in my lifetime, I, it's insane what's happened in the last 10 years. If you just remember 10, I mean, everyone in the room should be able to remember 10 years ago. Imagine if what's been from 10 years to now happens again, the same increase in wickedness, in immorality, and in sin. So, so much more as you see the day approaching, hang out with the church, be with your brothers and sisters, think about one another, love one another, stir up and do good works towards one another. He says before, verse two, the decree is issued on the day passes like, or the day passes like chaff. He says, do this before the day comes. That's the idea, before the decree is issued. Start gathering before it's too late or the day passes like chaff. Time is just gonna blow away and you didn't realize it's now gone. Before, do this before the Lord's fierce anger comes upon you. Before the day of the Lord's anger comes upon you. Seek the Lord, all you meek of the earth who have upheld his justice. Seek righteousness, seek humility. It may be that you will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. Interesting. I had someone ask me about the rapture of the church recently, and one thing that they brought up or that they had heard, they said is, well, is it true that the rapture of the church, it's not mentioned anywhere in the Old Testament, is it? And I go, no, there's, there's pictures and types, but I go, no, it's, it's not mentioned at all in the Old Testament. And they're like, well, doesn't that kind of then maybe disprove it? I said, well, here's the thing is, the church isn't mentioned in the Old Testament either. And if we read in the New Testament, Paul the Apostle says the church was a mystery, mysterion. It's that word for something that God didn't reveal. Yes, you can see hints, pictures, types. But there was no direct teaching in the Old Testament about the church. This is teaching about Israel. And if you do believe that God is going to come and take his church, but that Israel is going to endure the time of Jacob's trouble, well, it talks about here that you may be hidden. The church will be taken. Israel will be hidden. We read in Revelation um, starting in verse chapter 12 and going into 13 about how the child, we have the, the, the woman and she's going to flee into the wilderness. She's going to go down into, into Petra and how the beast is going to chase after her, but he's going to keep her supernaturally protected as a group of them go that way. There's going to be 144,000 who are saved and sealed, set apart, where all the wickedness on the earth that comes down can't touch this 144,000. And so we do see a promise here to Israel. You may be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. There'll be protection just like, and I've always wondered what it looked like. I don't know if you've ever spent time to meditate on this thought, but the 10 plagues of Egypt never struck Goshen. The darkness that came, which was one of the latter plagues. You think of all these other nasty things that happened before that. You think darkness, but you read some of the writings like Josephus. He said the darkness was so dark, you could feel it. That it was so thick, there was a tangible darkness did you just like walk through a, a, a veil when you got to Goshen and just all of a sudden, boom, there's the light and there's the sun and all you see around Goshen is just this wall of black? It's just amazing, but God did. He hid them from those diseases and pestilence and things. He'll hide them again. All right, now we're gonna see the judgment of the nations and I'll just put this up for you guys. This is just basically the breakdown. He goes west, east, south, north. I'm gonna pretty much read right through it because it's fairly self-explanatory starts off with the West. For Gaza, all this is Philistine territory, shall be forsaken, and Ashkelon desolate. They shall drive out Ashdod at noonday, and Ekron shall be uprooted. Woe to the inhabitants of the seacoast, the nation of the Cherethites. And those guys were related to the Philistines. No one is exactly sure how it works, but both the Philistines and these guys were supposed to be from Crete, just so you know. These were also some of the guys that uh, David hired as his elite mercenary force under, um, under Benaiah. 
And so there you go. You only really hear about them in that and here. There's only a few references to them. The word of the Lord against you, O Canaan, land of the Philistines, I will destroy you, so there shall be no inhabitant. The sea coast shall be pastures, the shelters for shepherds and folds for flocks. The coast shall be for the remnant of the house of Judah. They shall feed their flocks there in the houses of Ashkelon. They shall lie down at evening, for the Lord their God will intervene for them and return their captives. He started west, he moves to the east. I have heard the reproach of Moab and the insults of Ammon, with which they have reproached my people and made arrogant threats against their borders. Therefore, as I live, says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, surely Moab shall be as Sodom and the people of Ammon like Gomorrah, overrun with weeds and salt pits and a perpetual desolation. The residue of my people shall plunder them and the remnant of my people shall possess them. They, this they shall have for their pride because they have reproached and made arrogant threats against the people of the Lord of hosts. The Lord will be awesome to them for he will reduce to nothing all the gods of the earth. People shall worship him, each one from his place, indeed all the shores of the nations. It's just worth noting, um, Moab like Sodom, Ammon like Gomorrah, it's just a good reminder that Moab and Ammon are the byproduct of the events of Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah gets destroyed along with, well, four out of the five cities on the plain get destroyed. And then when they head off into the hills, Lot and his two daughters, Lot's daughters get Lot drunk. Lot's daughters conceive children by their father and they become the parents. Each child becomes the Moabites and becomes the Ammonites. So them becoming like Sodom and Gomorrah, it should be a story they're all very familiar with. I think I'm just going to read this to you guys. It was actually on my mind this morning in Habakkuk, but I have it pasted in my Bible in the book of Revelation when it talks about God preserving the woman and the child. I already made reference to Revelation 12, but how many of you guys, I, think, I don't know about you, but I'm personally very irritated by Philistines. I've never met a nice one. Have you? Moabites, also very wicked people, never met a nice Moabite. I've never been paid back alone by an Ammonite, right? All, all, all the ites of Canaan, they're gone. And yet Israel's still around. History, museums, you can go find all the archaeology of these nations. You know what else is gone? Egypt's gone. Oh, yeah, Egypt's still there, but it's not Egypt. It's not the world power, right? It's not Pharaoh and pyramids and chariots. It's a third world nation just kind of getting by, really struggling. There are no Babylonians. There are no real Persians anymore. Mark Twain, by no means a believer, the Egyptians, the Babylonians, and the Persians rose, filled the planet with sound and splendor, then faded to dream stuff and passed away. The Greeks and Romans followed and made vast noise, and they were gone. Other people have sprung up and held their torch high for a time, but it burned out. And they sit in twilight now and have vanished. The Jew saw them all, survived them all, and is now what he always was, exhibiting no decadence, no infirmities of age, no weakening of his parts, no slowing of his energies, no dulling of his alert but aggressive mind. All things are mortal but the Jews. All other forces pass, but he remains what is the secret of his immortality. An unbeliever asked that question. What is the secret of the Jew? How is it that they've survived so long? Well, we know the answer. God's looking out for them. And I think he still is. I think it's the same way us loving parents look out for our kids, even if they're off in the wrong places. We'll still watch out for them. We can't approve. And if we were a righteous judge and had to cast justice, we would judge accordingly. But we also would have an eye out for them, to, to care for them. All right, verse 12, one verse, you Ethiopians also shall be slain by the sword. He goes south, Cush. It, it is worth noting too in your Bibles, as we go through the Old Testament, uh, King James typically put Cush. New King James, most modern translations say Ethiopia. Ancient biblical Ethiopia is different from modern Ethiopia. It was a much larger territory. So 
modern day, you'd be encompassing multiple modern countries. So that's just worth noting that when you see Ethiopia, it's not just a modern country, it's a much larger territory. They controlled much of what was south of Egypt. If Egypt didn't control it, they controlled it. Verse 13, he'll stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria and make Nineveh a desolation. As dry as the wilderness, the herd shall lie down in our midst. Every beast of the nation, both Pelican and, and the bittern, shall lodge in the capitals of her pillars. Their voice shall sing in the windows. Desolation shall be at the threshold, for he will lay bare the cedar work. This is the day rejoicing city that dwelt securely, that said in her heart, I am it, and there is none besides me. How has she become a desolation, a place for beasts to lie down? Everyone who passes by her shall hiss and shake his fist. Nineveh got so utterly destroyed that only a few hundred years later, in fact, I want to say 612 is the fall of Nineveh. Herodotus was a Greek historian. In fact, he's like the father of history, I think, or what his name is, but it's like he was like the first great historian ever. And he followed around with the Persians and recorded history and stuff going on in the Middle East. And he passed by the ruins of Nineveh and couldn't recognize it. Like, he writes about where he went, and he never took note that he literally crossed over Nineveh. You couldn't even tell it was there. And Nineveh was like Babylon. Nineveh had huge walls, huge defenses. And so this is why they were the rejoicing city, dwelling in security. I mean, they, they were a huge city. Who could ever take us? but they came to fall. Chapter 3, it's backing up to Jerusalem again, backing up to Judah. So there was the surrounding nations, now to Judah. It says, Woe to her who is rebellious and polluted, to the oppressing city. She has not obeyed his voice. She has not received correction. She has not trusted in the Lord. She has not drawn near to her God. Her princes in her midst are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves that leave not a bone till morning. Her prophets are insolent, treacherous people. Her priests have polluted the sanctuary. They have done violence to the law. The Lord is righteous in her midst. He will do no unrighteousness. Every morning he brings his justice to light. He never fails, but the unjust knows no shame. He's just stating the condition of Jerusalem there towards the end before Babylon comes. And I hope that this doesn't become a description of the church at the very end. Yes, there were still believers in Jerusalem. I don't think it was without a remnant, and that's something we'll see here in a bit. It'll make re reference to the remnant. There was always a faithful remnant, and no matter what happens to the Christian church, there will always be a faithful remnant. But you might find the majority begin to shift a certain direction. Verse 6, I have cut off nations. Their fortresses are devastated. I have made their streets desolate with none passing by. Their cities are destroyed. There is no one, no inhabitant. I said, surely you will fear me. You will receive instruction so that her dwelling would not be cut off despite everything for which I punished her. But they arose early and corrupted all their deeds, i.e., even after I tried to discipline and correct her, they didn't just go off and sin. They got up early to sin. And you got to be some committed to something if you're getting up early for it. You know what I mean? Like, you wake up early to get to work. You have to. You get up early to go hunting during hunting season. Get up early to go fishing. Got to get there before the fish. If you wake up early, you're committed. And these people were committed to sin. They set their alarm clocks, you know. Eh, 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 you know, got to wake up and start sinning. And he's just painting this picture, though. He's showing it how fallen they have gotten. Verse 8. Therefore, wait for me, says the Lord, until the day I rise up for plunder. My determination is to gather the nations to my assembly of kingdoms to pour on them my indignation. All my fierce anger, all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. The Masoretes were the ones uh, who compiled the Old Testament text. Uh, most of our Bibles, our Old Testament is a Masoretic text. The Masoretes were the guys, the Jewish scholars who gathered all the scriptures and kind of made sure they had the same texts and types. 
uh, they also put verses to their stuff. And they, according to the Masoretes, Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 8, is the only verse in the Old Testament that has every Hebrew letter in the verse. I don't know what to do with that, but now you know. So there you go. But I, I, I'm reading some rabbinical stuff, and they pointed that out. But it was supposed to be an important verse. I mean, like they, they mentioned there's something about this verse. The fact that every letter was included from the whole Hebrew alphabet, there must be something weighty here. And he's saying, wait, because one day I will gather the nations and I will pour out my indignation on them with the fire of my jealousy. Revelation chapter 16 Verses 12 to 16. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they gather them together to the place called in Hebrew, Armageddon. And so this is what it's talking about. He says, one day I will gather all the nations. I will gather them all together and I will pour out my indignation on them. Oh, I don't have it off the top of my head, but Zechariah has got a pretty picturesque verse where it talks about, you know, people literally melting under the fire of the coming of the Lord. But I've got good news. We got through the day of the Lord. And now verse 9 to the end is what comes after. It's what comes next. For then, after this day, so after the battle of Armageddon, we can timeline this, I will restore to the peoples a pure language that they, may all, that they all may call on the name of the Lord to serve him with one accord. The idea of a pure language, it speaks of one tongue. After the battle of Armageddon, there will be a common language again, like before the Tower of Babel. That everyone may call on the name of the Lord. Psalm 86, verse 9, all nations whom you have made shall, shall one day come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. One day every nation will come and gather. Verse 10, from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my worshipers, the daughter of my dispersed ones, shall bring my offering. Zechariah chapter 8, verses 20 to 22. Thus says the Lord of hosts, peoples shall yet come, inhabitants of many cities. The inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, let us continue to go and pray before the Lord and seek the Lord of hosts. I myself will go also. Yes, many peoples and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and pray before the Lord. This all speaks of the millennial kingdom. The day of the Lord comes, Jesus returns, and then we have the 1,000 years of Christ. And you see all these verses, they all speak of nations coming before the Lord, everyone worshiping together in unity, the whole world worshiping in Jerusalem. We see verse 11, in that day you shall not be ashamed for any of your deeds in which you transgress against me. So no longer do you have to have any shame. Shame is gone. For then I will take away from you in your, I will take away from your midst uh, those who rejoice in your pride and you shall no longer be haughty in my mountain, holy mountain. I will leave in your midst a meek and humble people and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. So he's saying he's gonna take away the wicked and he's going to leave the just. Matthew 25, the sheep and the goats. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, all his holy angels with him, we will, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. And we're just going to jump down to the last verse of that chapter, verse 46, where it says, and these, the goats will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And even the grammar there is kind of important because again, it's the wicked are going to go away, but the righteous are going to continue on into eternal life. 
And so you see that separating of the sheep and the goats. I'm going to take away the wicked. I'm going to leave the righteous. Verse 13, the remnant of Israel shall do no unrighteousness and speak no lies, nor shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth, for they shall feed on their flocks and lie down, and no one shall make them be afraid. How? How is it that there'll be no unrighteousness during this time? No lies. And how can they have this great peace and tranquility of just being able to lie down and feed the flocks and rejoice? It's because Psalm 2.9 prophesies and Revelation 19.15 echoes that he himself will rule with an iron rod. It's prophesied in Psalm 2. It's achieved in Revelation 19. What is this rule with an iron rod? What we gather of the millennium is, you see the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints. Jude tells us, He's quoting Enoch is what he says, that believers come back with the Lord to rule and reign with him. It talks about us reigning with him. What does that look like? Well, it seems like part of God's worldwide justice and his worldwide government is that we have an omnipotent God on the throne, all-knowing, all-powerful. He's on the throne. And the idea is, is that his righteous ones, will, they will judge with him. They will keep the peace around the earth. It's not that people are incapable of sin, but Satan is locked up for the thousand years. So the tempter is gone. And thus, much temptation is gone. Yet humans are still humans. But it's going to be basically, you know, the whole nature versus nurture. Is it because you were born, you have these natural tendencies, or is it because of the way you were raised? Well, the millennial kingdom will be the dispensation. It'll be the period of time where you can't say it was nurture. You're going to have perfect nurture. If someone tries to commit sin, there will be someone to swiftly come in there and put an end to it. That's the ruling with an iron rod. It's a shepherd's rod, but it's an iron one. It's unbreakable and it's fierce is the idea. But the idea is that, yeah, people can just live in peace. And if anyone tried to break the peace, someone will come in. Jesus will put an end to that person trying to put an end to the peace. So then we get to rejoice. Verse 14, sing, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your judgments. He has cast out your enemy. The King of Israel, Yahweh, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall see disaster no more. In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, do not fear, Zion. Let not your hands be weak. Yahweh, your God, in your midst, the mighty one will save. And these three lines are, are powerful lines. He will rejoice over you with gladness. So in that day, God Almighty, he's rejoicing over you. God is excited. God is filled with joy because you are there with him. I'm sure we all think about the joy we will experience when we get to be with the Lord. But the Bible says that God also is looking forward to that day when he gets to be with us. Verse 17, the next part, New King James, he will quiet you with his love. The old King James, I think, translates it much better. And if you read the Hebrew and the best I can do, I'm no scholar, but I'm good with a concordance. King James just says, he will rest in his love. Sometimes I think the most obvious and literal translations get overlooked or get kind of changed because the theology doesn't make sense. What do you mean he's going to rest in his love? But if you read it literally, you'll notice you, at least the New King James, the word you is italicized. That's not even in there. There's no mention of anyone other than God. And the line before and the line after is God will rejoice, he will rejoice, and this, I think, is he will rest. That's the literal translation. He will rest in his love. What does that mean, then, if that's the better translation, if he will rest in his love? Well, God's love, as our love ought to be, is, is a proactive verb. It's an action. It's something you do. And I don't think God rests in his love right now. God has got a great and powerful love for his kids. And because 
the day of the Lord has not come. Because wickedness does abound. Because there are evil things taking place on this earth, God is not resting in his love. I think God is waiting, just like we are, for the day where he can rest in his love and just have us and not have to worry about all this other stuff that God could just have peace and joy himself in having us with him reigning and living and loving together. And it, that last line, he will rejoice over you with singing. Now there's many Bible verses that talk about us singing. And we know the angels are in heaven singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is. The, right? We know this. This is God is going to sing about you. And just a warning about when God sings to you. I, I just think this is a great cross reference you should have written in your Bible next to he will sing over you. Psalm 29. I'm just going to hit a few verses here. Psalm 29, verse 3. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. Verse 4. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. 5. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. 7. The voice of the Lord divides the flame of fire. 8. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. Verse 9, the voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth. And that voice will sing over you. He's going to rejoice over you with singing. Whoop, wrong thing. There we go. A few more verses. There's just some great, beautiful nuggets, at least something comforting to walk away with in these last verses. Verse 18, I will gather those who sorrow over the appointed assembly, who are among you, to whom its reproach is a burden. I can't speak for all of you, but this verse jumps out at me. In that day, those who sorrow over the appointed assembly, who are among you, to whom its reproach, the reproach of the assembly, is a burden. We ought to know that the ecclesia is the assembly. That's the church, our Greek word for church. Ek is out. And then the, the, the two words we put together, we get called out to assemble. We're called out to assemble, the assembly, the appointed assembly, God's church. There are people who sorrow uh, over the assembly when there's reproach. There's a burden on their hearts. You know, I don't, this actually hit me at the youth study just recently. And I don't think it ever had jumped out at me before, but it jumped out at me quite hard this last time I read it. Second Corinthians chapter 11 Paul gives his little rap sheet about all the things he's gone through. Just listen to this. You don't even need to flip. Just listen. He says, I speak as a fool. I am more in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, likely to death. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeys often, perils of waters, perils of robbers, perils of my own countrymen, perils of the Gentiles, perils in the city, perils in the wilderness, perils in the sea, perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. And it seems like he's building to something. And then he says, besides the other things... What comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. Shipwrecked was rough. Being stoned to death, that was worth writing home about. But let me tell you about the daily concern I have for the church. That's Paul writing. And so here it says, God says, In that day, I will gather those who sorrow over the appointed assembly the ones who see the condition 
and it breaks their heart to see it's not what it's supposed to be. This is not what it could be. This is not a revived, spirit-filled moving of God. It's, it's something waning. And he's going to gather them as well. Verse 19, he says, Behold, at that time, I will deal with all who afflict you. I will save the lame and gather those who were driven out. I will appoint them for praise and fame in every land where they were put to shame. At that time, I'll bring you back, even at the time I gather you, for I will give you fame and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I return your captives before your eyes, says the Lord. Israel will be carried away, but one day he'll gather them back. That's already happened now. But at this point, it hadn't. And he says, at that point, you're going to have fame. People are going to know who you are because it's, it's insane to see how God is gathering them back. You know, I think about our friend Jeremy who comes Sunday nights often. And he and I have just talked many a times. And I've shared before about how, according to Jeremy, who works with, you know, uh, social services, you might say, grants and different things with the Yakima tribe up in Toppenish. And he talks about it. He pastors at the main Christian uh, native church, uh, McKinley up there. And he says there's probably only a handful of people who can speak uh, Achiskin, the, the, the native language, fluently. He said there's very few. He's like, we're talking like under 10 of the elders. No one else can actually speak the language because it's been lost. Now, the Yakima Indian, they've only had a couple hundred years of being put on a reservation. They were actually put in one place with all their people. I'm not saying it's a good thing, but I'm saying in comparison, the Jews were driven out and scattered and just sent off and sent everywhere, persecuted and hated throughout the centuries. The Yakima tribe is barely holding on after 200 years to even speak their language, let alone maintain their true culture and identity. The Jews, after 2,000 years, are no less Jewish, like we read Mark Twain. God has just sustained them, and it is a miracle. And it is something you guys can testify to unbelieving friends. There is this, if they, people actually study history, it's miraculous that the Jewish people are what they are today. The day of the Lord will be fierce, but what follows will be worth it. I printed a little something. The first half is written by John Walrood, and the second half was something I put together. I wanted to read it rather than just, I'm not going to, I can memorize all this. But about the millennial reign of Christ. Some of you have maybe heard this first half before. It says, Jesus will be king on the earth, ruling from Jerusalem for a thousand years. He gives all the scriptures, like there's just piles of scriptures in this thing. Where the nations will come to worship and learn the ways of God. It'll start off with believers and will be marked by unified government where church-age believers and tribulation martyrs will co-reign with Christ. David will be prince of Israel. Jesus' apostles will judge from the 12 tribes of Israel. All weapons of war destroyed. There will be no wars. There will be worldwide knowledge of, the, of God, peace, justice, obedience, holiness, the fullness of the Holy Spirit, and increase in joy. Children will be born by those in their natural bodies. There will be prolonged life expectancy for those in their natural bodies. There will be comfort for those who would sorrow, removal of sickness, healing of the deformed, fruitful, enjoyable labor, one language, a change in the nature of ferocious animals, wonderful changes in the environment, and a millennial temple in Jerusalem where sacrifices will be made in remembrance of Christ's death. Why we pray Maranatha, come Lord Jesus, come. Because there will be no more army, no navy, no guns, no nukes, no terrorism, no prisons, no hospitals, no asylums or retirement homes or orphanages, no abortion centers. There'll be no global warming. There'll be no snow on Easter weekend. There'll be no April showers. Don't, don't realize it's already June. No rape, no child molestation. No incest, no abuse, no beatings, no pornography, no Fifty Shades of Grey and not even The Notebook. No more kids' movies with same-sex kiss scenes. No more LGBT parades, no drag queen reading time. No more Democrats, no more Republicans. No ballot mules, hanging chads, or dead people voting. Just one king, King Jesus. 
No bars, no casinos or strip joints, crack houses, pot shots, liquor stores. No IRS, no OSHA. No COVID, no masks, no bill collectors, no credit scores, no envy, jealousy, gossip, slander, boasting. No custody battles, no divorce, no adultery, no racism, no lawsuits or courts or cults or heresies, no false teachers, no prosperity gospel or emerging church, no deception. Nobody will be a cessationist nor an amillennialist. No psychologists, no psychics, no ACLU, no lawyers, no PETA, no Earth First, no deficit, no debt, no crime, no theft, no more cocaine, meth, fentanyl, no hangovers or overdoses, no more gangs, shootings, neither cops nor robbers, no more disease, no cancer, arthritis, Alzheimer's, dementias, no chemo, no shots, no vitamins or pills, no miscarriages, no infertility, no more wondering where God is, no more wondering how much longer there will be righteousness, justice, holiness, and love. The living word will rule over us as well as in our hearts. And wide-eyed children will be born who will sit and hear stories about war, disease, and false religion and be shocked to imagine that such things ever existed. I've got a lot in this life that I love, but there's a lot more to look forward to. And so we pray. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come and do your thing. We're ready for you. And so let us, as always, we walk away. I think prophecy, it, it does help us remember how to use our time wisely because the day is coming. In fact, chapter 1, verse 14, the great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hastens quickly. I think it's all the more true today. And so we ought to live like we believe it. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we do want to see you come. 